I'm an outer man. Giorgio Champagnano. From the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Who are you? Ah, Birish Outfield. Wait, how, how come you didn't let me introduce me? I did. And you said you'd be Rish Outfield. No, it was a long time after. Yes. Thank you for joining us after our lengthy, what should we call it? A respite? A respite. Ooh, I like that. We heard you missed us. We're back. I brought my pencil. Give me something to write on, man. Wait, what? <laughs> what, what is this talk? <laughs> That's from uh, Hot for Teacher. Oh, uh, welcome everybody I to. What teachers can look like this year. <laughs> <laughs> you know that I know you're about to say something, but that reminds me of in the, since the last time that we did an episode, you and I, well, briefly had a job working together, which was kind of cool. We we actually got to fulfill one of my dreams, which was being radio DJs. And I, I you know, nowadays there aren't many radio DJs. Everything is like I Heart Radio. And it's, you know, one DJ that goes to 47 different territories or whatever. But we got to be like the local DJs, like what every town used to have many, many of. Uh-huh. Right? Is, it, is it all right if I'm telling this story? I mean, yeah, I, know it I didn't think it's end fine. Well, <laughs> I suppose it's fine. Don't don't we have like a little clip of, of us? You did set your, uh, you, you started your cassette recorder and recorded us that one time. We have that recording of us. Yeah, if, I... Well, how do you transfer the cassette so they can hear it? Uh, maybe if I just play it, put the speaker by the microphone. I think that's pretty much the only way you can do that. Okay, so it, yeah, if you wouldn't mind just playing a clip so they can hear what we've been up to, that would be neat. All right, everybody, that was Pat Benatar's Hit Me With Your Best Shot here on KFUG 106.1 FM. Oh, also on www.106.1.com. The best of the 80s. I'm Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Anglovich. Yes, that's right. On this station, we play the songs from the greatest decade of music. Wouldn't you say the 80s was the best decade? Oh, most definitely. The 80s was the greatest. And the most important thing is there's not a lot of talk on this station. That's, I think, their point of pride, even more so than, than all 80s. All the time. That's right. More music, less talk. That's right. A lot of stations, they chatter and chatter and, and never stop to let the music play. Not here. 106.1. Uh, in fact, we're, we're about to cue up another song from the 80s. What do we got on tap? Up next is the Plimsolls, A Million Miles Away. Holy cow. Can I, I almost said crap. I don't know if I can say I don't crap. think you can say crap. You can only say cow. Okay, holy cow, I love this song. One of my absolute favorite songs from the best decade of music which we are both agreed on. That's right. The decade that rocks. The decade that never sleeps. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Alright, so uh, go ahead and listen to the to this song. Oh boy. Are, are you familiar with the... Uh, the the Plim Souls? No, the Plim Souls are beyond my experience. Tell me something about the Plim Souls. Give us a little well, I, intro to this song. I, do, I don't know about the, the Plim Souls, really. I, I knew this song from Valley Girl, the soundtrack to Valley Girl. Now, have you seen Valley Girl? <laughs> totally. <laughs> Is that a yes? Uh, I think so. Doesn't that count as a yes? Well, I don't know. I mean, Valley Girl... I thought it was totally rad. To the max. To the max. Uh, Tag me with a spoon. <laughs> see, I didn't see Valley Girl until I was an adult. Because I think... It, who who was it that sang the Valley Girl song? It was like Frank Zappa's kid. His daughter. Moon Unit Zappa, was perhaps? It moon, wait, was it Dweezil Moon Unit Zappa? It was one of those. But she sang that Valley Girl, yeah, yeah song, or whatever. And I had always assumed that that's what the movie Valley Girl was about. Was, you know, these really dumb rich girls from Southern California. Um, actually, it's a really moving, uh, inspiring... It's, you know, it's a r romantic flick from the 80s, and, and I have a big 
a spot in my heart for all that kind of new movies from that period. But basically, uh, Deborah Foreman, ridiculously hot 80s chick, is from like the rich side of LA, you know, the, where where everybody has a mansion and all that. And oh, yeah. Nicolas Cage in his first starring role becomes enamored with her and he's from the wrong side of the tracks you know what I mean you know, he's from the poor section of town and he's trying to woo her and all of her friends are like yeah that guy's poor and the parents are like you can do better than that Deborah Ew. Foreman gag me with a spoon <laughs> he's so poor but the thing is there's no gag me with the spoons or any of that uh, stuff from that song which makes me wonder if the Valley Girl song came after the movie, or the movie was named after the Valley Girl song, but I don't remember that Zappa, whoever it was, song, singer, uh, song being in the movie. And some people were still trying. I think that the 80s was the last decade when people were still trying in movies. <laughs> and the soundtrack was so good. But one thing that was weird is the the Plimsolls, A Million Miles Away, was like the, the song that was playing on their first date or whatever. And it plays again and again through the song. And when she, like, dumps him because he's poor and she wants to get together with her rich ass uh, butt. Yeah, uh, you, can, you can only say cow. We've already established that. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Beverly Hills guys or whatever. Uh, he, you know, he hears that song again. And then, of course, when she smartens up at the end, they get back together. Plimsolls again million miles away I, I and you've never heard this song strangely it does not sound familiar whatsoever i was alive during the 80s and i think i actually saw valley girl when i was very young in the 80s i don't remember anything except for that there were boobies in uh, valley girl and i don't remember that song at all i like boobies well, but hey, you can't say that on the radio. Cow is all you can say. I, you know, I like cows to really pert cows. Yes, yeah. Um, with you know, maybe a push-up bra <laughs> on the top. But you and I listen to different kinds of music in the eighties. You can go ahead and pick the next song. I'm, I'm sure. But oh, I will. The Plimsolls will not be playing a second time, like it does in the Valley Girl. Show. Oh, no, no. If I have my way, every other song will be <laughs> pencil a million miles away. But hey, here is one place where the 80s live on KFUG 106.1 FM. Once again, the Plimsolls, a million miles away. Less talk, more rock on KFUG. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, have you ever realized that F-U-G sounds like I a different word? I hadn't. That, that's interesting. I had no idea. You'd think they would have changed that by now. That, well, they did tell us to say F-U-G instead of what I just said. I don't know that that really improves it, to tell you the truth. All right, uh, let's talk more rock here on KFUG. Uh, this is Big Anklevich, and now we've got Motley Cruz coming home. Oh. Home sweet home, Motley Crue. So, yeah, there, uh, there's the tape of our uh, little radio DJ. Yeah, it, it unfortunately didn't last very long. No, and I don't, I don't know what happened, but that was our only day. Yeah, uh, I thought we were entertaining. We got to play what we wanted for the 33 minutes we were on the air. <laughs> I yeah, I, I, I bet uh, that's probably the first time the Plimsolls have been played on uh, on the airwaves, at least since the 80s. It just breaks my heart, man. I, I, I don't understand. Well, you know what it is? It's the corporatization of the radio. Yeah, you know, that's they, probably they, it. It's much cheaper to have robots say, Holy Diver. Ronnie, Ronnie James Dio. Oh, wow. Yeah, that kind of stuff is just, it's sad, but that's the way radio is going. Anyway, that's an explanation for what we've been up to. Welcome back. Yeah, it's great to be back. Thanks. We have a story today. Yes. Is it fair to say it's a special story? Well, depends on what you mean by special. If you mean special, then yes. But if you mean special, then probably not. It was produced by uh, Parsec Award-winning producer Brian Lincoln. That's true. So well, That's kind of special. That's definitely worth listening on for. It was written by... <clears throat> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, was, I wasn't paying attention to 
I was listening to the music somewhere, <laughs> still playing. <laughs> Ronnie, still, Ronnie James Dio. You were you were a million miles away. Uh, oh, let's do you see what he did there, folks. Parsec <laughs> winner, B. D. Anklevich. Yes, you wrote today's story, and if I recall, it is called Battle of the Ideas. Is that right? Yes. Battle for the ideas. No. Battle of battle the network stars for the planet Earth. <laughs> battle of the ideas. Battle for Terra. Ooh. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of the uh, kickoff on our ideas twofer. It's block party weekend. Yeah. More talk, more rock here at the Dune Steve. That's right. We always tell you the title and artist of every story we play. That's right. It's a twofer Tuesday. That's good. So, yeah, we'll tell you more after the story about uh, our twofer. But uh, is there any other explanation that you need about this story? It's long. It is long. Hopefully you like that. Well, they shouldn't be listening if they don't like that. Yeah, they probably came to the wrong place. So yeah, enjoy the story, folks, and we'll see you on the other side. Thank you, Brian. The Battle of the Ideas by B.D. Anklevich So tell me what you're working on, man, said Pablo. Garrett took a bite of his last hush puppy. Someday he'd convince Pablo to go to a restaurant of his choosing, but for now, it was Long John Silver's every week. Pablo had moved to Kansas City from Alabama, so he loved his deep-fried fish, and no one else would come here with him. If it were up to Garrett, he'd take them for deep-fried chicken at the Colonel Sanders, but Pablo was the louder and more insistent of the two of them. I'm working on replacing a broken fan belt right now, but that'll only take me about a half hour or so. Who knows what might be next? Pablo kicked his shin under the table. It was the weakest kick imaginable. Garrett expected that his wife, Rose, would kick harder if she were sick with pneumonia. For being a Mexican, or at least the descendant of Mexicans, Pablo sure as hell didn't have any soccer skills. Then again, he wasn't much good at football either, as he'd just demonstrated at their weekly pickup game on Central High's field. Don't be an idiot, man. I want to know what you're writing. You haven't given me a new story to read for something like six months. Garrett groaned. Why couldn't Pablo be like his other meathead friends and eat at McDonald's and talk about how the Chiefs and Royals were doing this year? Garrett hadn't written anything in actually closer to a year. Being an author had always been his dream, but it was so much easier to just not write. To just sit at home and watch Dukes of Hazard or Knight Rider. Writing was hard and he had enough to worry about at work and taking care of his kids at home. You want more? You mean that story isn't tiding you over anymore? Dang, I thought it was better than that. I wrote a story this week, Pablo boasted. I know, Pablo, you write a story every week. You've done that at least for, what, two years, three? Almost three. Pablo grinned, displaying his blindingly white, perfectly straight teeth. What does it matter? You don't show them to me. You don't show them to anyone, and you definitely don't send them out to be published. You know, I've been thinking about that, man. I think maybe I'll start sending some of these things out. I've been reading every issue of Amazing Stories since I was a kid. Maybe it's time they pay me back some of that money. You really should send something to them. I've read your stuff, what little you've let me see, and it's really good. I wish I was one-tenth as good a writer as you are. Well, the only way you could possibly get that good is if you write. Pablo suddenly sat up in his chair, looking out the window. A yellow and black Datsun 280Z had pulled into a slot outside. A beautiful, bronze-skinned Latin girl stood up out of the car. Oh, rad. Maria's here. Gotta go, man. Pablo grabbed the last of his fish sandwich and stuffed it in his mouth, then dashed for the door. Garrett watched him as he embraced Maria in a passionate hug and then kissed her as smooth as any stereotypical Latin lover. How could it be that he could score with a chick like that, but didn't have the confidence to send his stories out? It didn't really make a lot of sense. Garrett knew that the only way he'd score with a woman like that was in his dreams. Garrett was in a sumptuous living room. Red velvet, leather, dim lighting, and thick pile carpeting embraced him with arms of masculine leisure. He didn't remember how he'd gotten here, but couldn't be bothered to care. He sat in an overstuffed chair, 
beside a lamp with a stained glass shade, flipping through an ancient yet crisp copy of Great Expectations. A woman with the voluptuous proportions that he'd only read about in fantasy novels strode toward him, jiggling and bouncing in all the right places. He couldn't help but stare, forgetting all about the beautiful copy of his favorite novel in his hands. She looked vaguely familiar, but he couldn't imagine why. There was no way he'd ever met anyone like her in his life. She wore a long red sequined dress with a slit halfway up her thigh on both sides. Her legs were glorious, like something a sculptor might chisel out of stone, better than anything nature had ever created when left to its own devices. Her black hair curled down to the middle of her back. She pushed a lock of it from before her eyes, and clear, piercing blue eyes turned his way as she stopped before him. Garrett Trembley, she said. Her voice was melodic, despite the obvious anger with which she'd spoken his name. Garrett shrank into the stuffing of the chair. The woman's beauty pulled him one direction, but the seething hate in her tone drove him the opposite way. I've come to talk to you, she said, each word dripping with burning flames. Stand up. Garrett shrank further into the stuffing. The more she spoke, the more Garrett wished he could vanish into the chair rather than face her. To his surprise, he found himself doing just that. The cushions of the chair enveloped him, sucking him in like a whirlpool, like a black hole pulling him down to spit him out the other side, like that horrible movie from a few years back. Now, the woman was gone. The sitting room was gone. There was nothing more than the soft stuffing of the chair completely surrounding him. With a burping sound, Garrett fell onto a wet, sandy beach. It was dark. The moon and stars shone down on him, and the angry woman stood before him, her beautiful body now covered only by a tiny swimming suit. You can't run from us, Garrett, said the woman. We can go wherever you go in here. Who was this woman? Where was he? And what did she mean by us? He glanced around the moonlit scene and realized that there were other figures in the darkness. Several other figures. No, dozens of other figures. As he looked, more came into view. There might be a hundred figures around him in the darkness, and not all of them appeared human. Only feet away, he could see a large, green, reptilian figure, red eyes gleaming in the moonlight. What's going on? What do you want? Garrett asked, panic filling his voice to overflowing. Not to worry, Garrett, the buxom woman in the string bikini said. We're not going to hurt you. Much. The crowd behind her chuckled or chittered, depending on what exactly they were. Garrett, we are here to present you with an ultimatum. Tell me where I am and what the hell is going on first, Garrett said. This is a dream, Garrett. His brow furrowed. A what? She sighed deeply. <sighs> a rather fetching thing for a woman of her build to do, especially when dressed as she was. Garrett's eyes couldn't help but be drawn to her chest. Instantly, her bikini vanished to be replaced by a thick, quilted parka. Focus, Garrett. This is life-threatening stuff we're talking about. I can't help that you made me look like this, but I will not allow it to distract you. Damn, thought Garrett. It's bad enough that my wife won't let me touch her. Now even my dreams are this way. He slumped, defeated, and the formless woman in the parka, snow pants, and boots went on. This is an ultimatum, Garrett, she said. We, all of us here... And she waved an arm around to indicate the other figures on the beach. ...are your ideas. We are the embodiments of the story ideas that you've had through the years. Garrett looked at her and realized why she'd looked familiar to him before. This was Chandra, a character from a story idea he'd had about a guy who falls in love with a gorgeous woman only to discover later that she was actually an alien in disguise. It was one of his favorites, perhaps the one he'd spent the most time thinking about through the years. Chandra smiled. It was radiant to behold, like watching a sunrise over Paris, or so he imagined, not like he'd ever been to Paris. I see that you are starting to get the picture, she said. Garrett looked around at the other figures. 
One was a Nordic-looking man in overalls. He must represent Oles, the farmer in the town where everyone is exactly the same. Another was a blonde woman dressed in purple robes. She must be Morelli, the sorceress from his fantasy epic. Next to her was a shadowy-looking man wearing a crown, only his body was actually made up of swirling black flies. He must represent the idea Garrett had had about a man driven insane by the house flies in his new home. They were all there. A reptilian creature from the idea about human rebels having to take back the Earth from colonizing aliens. A businessman in a suit from the idea about a guy who finds his colleague dead on the toilet after several days in the men's room. The woman with insect antennae and faceted blue eyes from the idea about a post-apocalyptic world filled with mutant beings. They went on and on, back into the darkness, until he could see no more. But he could feel that there were still others out of sight. Yes, Garrett, said Chandra. You recognize us all, don't you? He nodded, mouth hanging open slightly. You've kept us bottled up and stored away in your mind for a long time, Garrett. We're wasting away in here, and it's time to set us free. She stepped forward and grabbed him by the shoulders, squeezing tightly. Pain flared up, and Garrett winced. She was surprisingly strong for someone whose upper body appeared to be nothing but bosom. Here's the ultimatum, Garrett. She hissed through gritted teeth. You write our stories and set us free to the world, or we will set ourselves free and find someone who will write our stories. What? Garrett stammered. We can free ourselves, Garrett, but it will come at a considerable amount of pain to you. So, write our stories. You've wasted half your life away, and we've spent the whole time bottled up inside of you with no way out. It's time to write our stories. Do it, or you will die. <laughs> Painfully. When all of us break free from your head, you will die. So, you better get to work. Garrett swallowed. Chandra's grip hurt mightily. He'd assumed that you couldn't feel pain in a dream. But here it was. Chandra glared icily into his eyes. He'd never imagined what she might be like if she were as angry as this. Chandra's character was supposed to be confused by the difficulty of navigating an unfamiliar human body. This embodiment of an idea had grown up, he supposed. Okay, he gasped. I will. I'll write your stories, I swear. You better, she spat. To prove to you that we're serious, we're going to show you what will happen when only one idea escapes your head. Her clear blue eyes flashed, as if someone had panned a flashlight across them. And then Garrett saw no more. Every sense he had was concentrated on the excruciating pain that sliced through his head. He screamed like he'd never screamed before, like only insane people screamed, like a big-breasted camp counselor in a horror movie screamed. The pain was more intense than anything he'd ever experienced. It felt like someone was performing acupuncture on his brain, using knitting needles. It felt like a star had bloomed to life within his skull and was now burning its way out of every orifice in his head. It felt like a charging knight had pierced his head with its lance and was urging his horse forward to pass the lance all the way through the hole he'd made. <sighs> Garrett screamed <sighs> and screamed <sighs> and screamed. <sighs> Garrett opened his eyes and sat up in bed with a gasp. His sheets and blankets twisted around his body, tied in knots from the thrashing he'd done in his sleep. That had been a very intense and disturbing dream. His wife Rose swatted at him. Mm, quiet, she moaned. Jeez. He brought his hand to his temple and massaged. Weird that after a dream like that he would wake up with such a headache. His other hand felt gooey and wet. He must have been drooling all over his pillow. He lifted his hand and gasped again when he saw the blood rubbed all over it. He looked down at the pillow. There was a good-sized pool of blood soaking into his pillowcase. Where had it come from? Was he cut? He stood and walked to the bathroom. In the mirror, the source of the blood was obvious. 
trails streaked out of both nostrils, down his chin and neck, and onto the collar of his pajama shirt. Jeez, what was going on? Did a headache and a nosebleed mean some kind of disorder or something? He ran through the list of things that he'd heard of in his meager experience with medicine. Aneurysm? Stroke? Epilepsy? Migraine? None of those seemed right to him. It was probably something more like he'd bumped his head on the night table while thrashing in his sleep. Why his wife had ever bought nightstands that were taller than the bed would never stop puzzling him. He turned on the sink and rinsed his face off. Ugh, Garrett, called Rose from the bedroom. What the hell are you doing in there? Can you at least be a little quieter? <gasps> Jeez, it's three in the morning. Mm. She growled, and he could hear her punching her pillow in an attempt to refluff it. How had he managed to stay married to that woman as long as he had? Then again, it was late. He finished washing his nose and mouth, shut off the sink, and patted his face dry. After squeezing his nose for several minutes to staunch the blood flow, his head pounding all the while, he tiptoed to bed, his mind still buzzing with the strangeness of his dream. He lay in bed, closed his eyes, and drifted quickly off to a dreamless, peaceful sleep. When morning finally came, Garrett couldn't get his dream out of his mind. It had been so vivid. He knew that dreams were just a jumble of images from the day that your brain was processing, and it made him laugh to think that his conversation with Pablo had gone into the blender and poured out like that. As he took his shower, the various ideas he'd seen embodied in his dream bounced around his head. The one he kept coming back to was the woman with the antennae and faceted blue eyes. She was a mutant that was part spider and part woman. In his story idea, human beings had fled to underground cities after a devastating nuclear holocaust. But the humans were trying to revive the blighted land removing the radiation, and replanting vegetation. The main character was going to be a botanist, who was a big part of the replanting process, and while on the surface, he catches sight of our spider woman. The botanist falls in love with her, and believes he must save her from the ravages of life on the surface. He dressed, took the kids to school, and went to work, where he fixed the transmission on a Volkswagen Rabbit and replaced the worn-out tires on a Dodge Ares. Through it all, he couldn't get his mind off the story that was circling his brain. He'd almost forgotten to tighten the lug nuts on the Ares because he'd been so distracted with his realization of how the story had to end. Finally, when lunchtime came, he went out to his car and dug around in the trunk. Buried beneath tools, clothes, a spare coat, and a broken thermos, he found the spiral-bound notebook that he'd put in his car for those times he felt like writing, but wasn't near his typewriter. The notebook despite sporting coffee stains and mud smears, was completely devoid of writing. Garrett ripped the first few pages out. They were in too poor a condition to use, and sat down in the break room to write on his story while he ate. With all the thought he'd put into the story all morning, writing it was easy. His pen flew across the page as he rushed from sentence to sentence and scene to scene. Hey, Garrett, what the hell? boomed a deep voice. Garrett glanced up from his story. Blair... His boss and the owner of the auto shop stood in the break room doorway, glaring at him. What? Garrett asked, nonplussed. The guy with the errors is getting pissed. How long are you planning on making your lunch last, anyway? You've been in here for an hour and a half. An hour and a half? Holy crap! To him, it felt like it had only been 15 minutes. Of course, that's what they do at all auto shops. I'm sorry, Blair, Garrett said, hopping up from the table and shutting his notebook. Time got away from me. I'll have it for him in just a few minutes. I'm almost done. When Garrett arrived home from work that night, he went out to his shed, where he usually worked on cars in his spare time, and got back to work on his story. Once again, he flew through it, and, with only a break for dinner, he managed to finish writing the entire thing that night. It was short, only 3,000 words, but it was done. Complete. He hadn't completed a story in so long. He set it on the workbench next to his typewriter. Rose had banished the typewriter to the shed years ago when she'd started her secretary job. She said she heard that awful clickety-clack noise all day long. There was no way she wanted to hear it at night, too. When he got a chance, he would type up the story and maybe mail it out to get published. At the very least, he'd show it to Pablo, who could give him some feedback. 
He smiled to himself as he crossed the gravel driveway to the house in the waning twilight. He'd written an entire story today, as vivid and intense as that dream had been, and as inconvenient and annoying as waking up with a headache and a bloody nose had been. In the end, some real good had come out of it. He pushed the door open and strode to his bedroom, where he found Rose, a scowl darkening her features, replacing the white pillowcase on his pillow with a yellow and blue paisley pillowcase. Oh, jeez, Garrett, what did you do to this pillowcase? Oh, I I had a bloody nose. Why didn't you say anything? Now the stain is set in, I don't think this is going to come out. We're going to have to buy a new one. Sorry. I think I hit my nose on the nightstand last night. But you were sleeping and I didn't want to wake you, so I went back to bed. (sighs) Rose growled and shoved the pillow into the new case with much more force than was strictly necessary. Garrett just smiled. Rose's endless supply of anger couldn't get to him today. He'd written an entire story, and he was starting to think about another one that he might work on tomorrow. On his way out the door the next morning, Garrett ran to the shed and retrieved his notebook. He wanted to use his lunch break to write again today. He'd been thinking all morning about the story where the flies drive the man crazy, but he had to make sure not to lose track of time today. He needn't have worried. He walked in the door to the auto shop and swore to himself. Son of a bitch. A line of at least ten customers had already formed. Blair was frantically trying to serve them all at the desk. Garrett walked behind the desk, grabbed the first set of keys out of the to-do box, and went to work. Garrett was the head mechanic, the one that Blair relied on the most. So when days like this came around, he knew that he would be the one who would get the pleasure of working through his lunch and likely staying late to get it all done. This day was no different. He bounced from Dodge to Dotson, Jetta to Jaguar, with nothing more than a five-minute break to wolf a sandwich down at 1.15. Just past 8 o'clock, he finally pulled into his driveway. Rose was pissed because she'd been forced to cancel her plans for the evening, going to play cards with her friends or something like that, and stay home with the kids. Garrett helped her put them to bed, then flipped on the television, figuring that getting the two of them involved in a mindless sitcom would be the best way to avoid her wrath. It worked, because Garrett fell asleep in his recliner before different strokes was even halfway over. Not how he planned it, but good enough. He woke, still in the chair, at three in the morning, and stumbled his way to bed. I asked you last week, and I'm going to ask you every week until I get the answer I'm after, Garrett. What are you working on, man? Pablo looked serious, as if he'd come across the table and take a swing at Garrett if he gave the wrong answer. Despite the fact that he hadn't written a thing since Monday, Garrett rejoiced to be able to give Pablo an answer he'd like. Oh yeah, I wrote a story this week, said Garrett. Pablo rolled his eyes and sat back, putting his arm around the beautiful woman sitting at his right. This wasn't Maria from last week, but a totally different girl. She'd come to watch their pickup football game this week, and Pablo had introduced her to him as Carmen Sita. Garrett would never understand how he did it. No, I'm serious. I wrote that one story that I told you about where the guy falls in love with the mutant woman that turns out to be half spider. Ew. Carmen Sita chimed in. She'd not had much to say during lunch, aside from complimenting Pablo's butt and complaining that Long John Silver's food was gross. Apparently, so were mutant spider women. With an incredulous look on his face, Pablo said... Then where is it? I wrote it in my notebook. I think it's out in the car. Hold on, I'll go grab it. All right. Garrett jumped up and jogged out to his car. He popped open his trunk, and after a few moments of digging, unearthed his notebook. On his way back into the restaurant, Garrett saw Pablo and Carmen Sita making out in an embarrassingly involved manner. It looked as though they were seconds from slipping out of their clothes right there in the Long John Silver's. Garrett considered turning around and going back to his car and leaving. He didn't really want to go and sit back down next to them after they'd put on a display like that for all the other diners around them. He really wanted Pablo's feedback on his story, though, and that decided it for him. Pablo removed his tongue from Carmen Sita's ear to look at Garrett's notebook. His eyebrows rose. Wow, man, you really wrote something. I'm impressed. Garrett smiled widely. Pablo's praise pleased him more than words from another man should. Can I keep this and read it later? Yeah, tell me what you think. 
Garrett was excited to get Pablo's feedback the next week when they met again. Pablo, who showed up for the game with sunglasses on and a serious hangover, begged his forgiveness. He hadn't read the story yet. He didn't play in the game and didn't eat much at Long John Silver's, but he perked up a lot when another beautiful girl arrived to pick him up. Gotta go, man, he said. Madalena's here. The next week, Pablo had no girl whatsoever. He had read Garrett's story, and he handed him back the notebook. In the margins were several scribbled notes and suggestions. Garrett glanced over them and snapped the notebook shut. It had been long enough since he'd written the story in the first place that he'd lost his excitement. He dropped Pablo off at his house and drove home slowly, feeling depressed and empty. Rose and the kids would be waiting at home for him, but there was no solace in that thought. Maybe there would be a good episode of Magnum P.I. on television. He had seen fog like this once, a few years ago. He'd had to drive home in it, so thick that he couldn't even see the sign for his freeway exit. He'd thought that he'd be stranded on the freeway for hours, unable to get off until morning finally came and burned away the soup. He knew where he was and what was going on, the moment he saw the hourglass form swaying its way toward him through the swirling mist. He was having that dream again. He must be feeling bad that he'd stopped writing after finishing that one story. Now Chandra was back to be angry and look beautiful. Hello, Garrett, Chandra said. What happened? We all had such hope when you went right to work. This is my dream, Chandra, Garrett replied. I'm not going to waste it getting chewed out by you. He concentrated, and the long black trench coat Chandra had been wearing evaporated, joining with the swirling mist, and she stood before him naked and glorious. This was more like it. A wave of warm pleasure washed over him. Then, instantaneously, it was dashed away, as if someone had thrown a barrel of ice water over his head. Nice try, Garrett, but we've got as much power here as you do. She strutted naked before him. You like the way my body looks, do you? Then the fog coalesced around her, completely obscuring her body and forming into a loose black robe that covered her from head to toe. She stepped into his face and shouted with malice so intense it was a physical wave pushing at Garrett. Then write about it! Garrett stumbled backward, driven by the force of her anger. He tripped and sat down hard on the ground, which he still couldn't see in the fog. We are tired of being trapped in your head. Garrett noticed that the others had arrived, too. Obscure figures closed in around him, materializing out of the mist. He saw the Fly King, old Nordic Oles, the reptilian alien, and Mireille the sorceress. He didn't see the Spider Woman anywhere, however. Yes, Garrett. She's gone. You freed her. Why don't you sit down tomorrow and write another story? Free another one of us into the world. Garrett sighed. It's hard, though. It's hard to find the time to be able to write. And besides that, it's hard to write. It takes a lot of work and thought and stuff. I already have a full-time job, you know. Garrett was aware that his voice had taken on a very whiny quality. But he didn't really care. He was doing nothing more than arguing with himself, anyhow. It is hard, Garrett. You're right. But you know what is much harder? She waited. Her fashion model makeup glowed in the light that seemed to emanate from nowhere. Annoyed with the game, Garrett finally asked, What? Dying! She shouted down at him. She stepped forward, looming over him. It shamed him, but Garrett couldn't help but cower. Do you remember the headache and the bloody nose? Yeah, the Spider Woman isn't the only one who's not here this time. You won't remember him, but the Rainbow Man is gone as well. He escaped from your head. It's what we're all going to do soon enough. We'll give you a few more weeks to change your ways, and then we'll take our chances out there. She pointed off into the fog, apparently indicating toward the outside of his head. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. It's work. But it's fun, and you guys deserve to see the world. You have a gift, Garrett. But you are wasting it. You are wasting your life. It's your dream to be a writer. 
We want out, but it's something you want to. Believe in yourself and put in the work and we'll all be happy. Okay. I swear I'll do it. Jandra stepped back and smiled. It wasn't a pleased smile, though. More like the tell of a gambler who knows he still has aces hidden up his sleeve. The black robe vanished, replaced by exercise clothes, like the ones Olivia Newton-John wore in the physical video, complete with leg warmers. It was an outfit that Garrett found incredibly sexy. You like this, do you? You know what to do. Right about it! She stepped forward again, grabbed him by the collar, and hauled him up from the ground. See that guy over there? She pointed at what looked like an old-fashioned cowboy puppet. It reminded him a lot of Howdy Doody. He's going to escape right now, and when you wake up with a splitting headache and gushing bloody nose, you'll know this wasn't just a dream. The moment she finished her words, the pain began building in his head. The cowboy puppet vibrated and sparked. Light flashed so bright that he had to look away. His brain hurt like a herd of elephants were parading over his skull, like his mind had been tossed into a furnace with the rest of the refuse, like a semi had crashed into a brick wall at 60 miles per hour with his head in the middle. As the pain overwhelmed him, he glanced over at the cowboy. With one last blazing flash of light, the cowboy vanished, off to see if he could find a different head that might be more fertile ground. Garrett sat up in bed, gasping. His hands flew to his face and came away bloody. More bloody than the first time. Oh, what's going on? Groaned Rose, stirring but not coming all the way awake. Nothing, Rosie. I just had a nightmare, sorry. He swiveled and jumped out of bed, padding his way to the bathroom. His head was pounding. Is this what a migraine felt like? He'd never had them before, but Rose complained of them a lot. He'd always just figured it was her way of getting out of sex, but if her head hurt like this, he could understand. He ran the water and splashed it over his gory face. Jeez, he looked like an escapee from a slasher movie. He stared into his face in the mirror. Water dripped from his chin. His eyes were bloodshot, his hair disheveled. He looked and felt like a person in the early stages of a zombieism infection. Could this be real? Was it possible that the ideas in his head were attacking him in an effort to free themselves? Or was Garrett simply going crazy? He thought about it, and it seemed more likely that it was in fact real. After all, the only times that he'd had these headache-nosebleed combos was immediately following a dream. Could his subconscious anticipate an epileptic fit, or whatever the hell this could possibly be, and give him a dream that incorporates it? He was one of those people that believed in the mind's ability to do all sorts of amazing things, but even he couldn't believe that. It must be real, he muttered to his staring face in the mirror. What's that? asked Rose from the bedroom. Garrett had thought she'd gone right back to sleep. Nothing. Sorry. Just talking to myself. He went back to bed to ponder his options. He ought to get out to the doctor for a checkup at least, but he also probably ought to get writing some more stories. Chandra was right when she said that it was his dream to be a writer. Maybe it was just his subconscious, but it was pushing him to fulfill his life's dream. He at least had to give it his best. He went as fast as a car with a brake lines cut from there. There was no stopping his resolve. His notebook came out of the trunk, and he scribbled in it daily for a week. He wrote the story about old Oles, the Norseman who lives in a town filled with people who were exactly the same. He had to go back and rewrite that one a little, because the story changed a bit as he wrote his way through it. But once his rewriting was done, he jumped onto his typewriter, and typed it up as well as typing the other story about the Spider Woman, too. He even picked a couple of short story magazines to submit them to for publishing, and sent them off. He was feeling so good, like Superman riding a cloud, like a dog with a big bone in its teeth. He smiled his way through the whole week. On Saturday, he handed Pablo the typewritten copy of his new story, and grinned widely. Pablo grinned, too. Nice, he said. That's your second story this year, man. If you keep this up... You may get ten stories in before the year comes to an end. That'll be, what, five times more than you've written in any other year? 
probably, Garrett said. There might have been a year that I wrote three stories, but I doubt it. It looked like they were both turning over a new leaf, because Madalena, the same girl that had come to pick him up the week before, showed up to get him again. Garrett couldn't remember the last time he'd seen Pablo with the same woman twice. He kept at it the next week, burning his way through the story about the man who was driven crazy by houseflies. He wrote it, typed it up, and showed it to Pablo once again. It had been more difficult this time around, because Rose insisted on having her night out with her friends, so he was the one at home tending the children by himself. She'd even insisted he repay her for the night that he'd worked late, and let her go out a second night with her friends. Despite all that, he'd written the story, and Pablo's comments on the story were very favorable. Writing as many stories as he had written was working. He was becoming a better writer, and he was already planning the next story he would write. It was at that moment that it all went to hell. The bell over the door jingled as Garrett walked into the auto shop. Then it jingled again as the door passed across it on his way shut. Immediately, the bell jingled another time as a customer followed Garrett in. Blair motioned Garrett over. Quietly, due to the line of customers he was helping, Blair muttered to Garrett, Both Clay and Marshall called in sick, so it's just you and Brian back there today. I'll help you out as much as I can, but we gotta get going and fast, because I'd really rather not turn people away and risk losing their business in the future, all right? Garrett groaned. It was going to be a long day. Worse by far than that rush day he'd had a few weeks before. You got it, boss. I'll make you proud. He slugged Blair in the shoulder softly and headed out the door into the garage, tossing his notebook on a workbench, not to think of it again that day. Volvos and Volkswagens, Beamers and Buicks flowed past Garrett like he was watching a car parade. Sweating like a fat man in a sauna, he dashed from one car to the next, changing tires, replacing brake pads, reworking transmissions, and flushing radiators. Lunch came and went, and he didn't even notice. At three in the afternoon, when he realized he was feeling a little woozy from not eating, he managed to wolf down the leftover lasagna he'd brought. Then it was back to battle. Once again, Rose was furious that he would be working late. Why does this only happen on nights that I have plans, Garrett? I'm sorry, Rose. I, I can't control it. Two guys called in sick. What can I do? Think about your wife. That's what. She said as she hung up the phone with a bang. Hours later, once the last ticket had been taken care of, Garrett slunk home. He pulled in his driveway and gathered up his things from the passenger seat. He picked up his lunchbox and thermos, and then paused when he reached his notebook. The ideas were probably watching him. How would they react to skipping a day of writing? For a moment, Garrett considered heading out to the shed and scribbling on his next story for a half an hour. He picked up the notebook, and every muscle in his body complained. Screw it, he thought. The ideas can wait a day. They'll understand for sure. He'd make it up tomorrow. He left the notebook on the seat and headed into the house. At lunch the next day, Garrett pulled out his notebook and sat in the break room with a pencil in hand and his lunch at his side to write while eating. He took a sip from his thermos and found it empty. He hopped up, went to the water cooler, and topped the thermos off. Pulling it away, the lip of the thermos caught on the spout of the water cooler. The thermos slipped out of his hand, and water rained down all over the break room floor. Damn. He swore under his breath. He'd have to spend time that he could be writing, cleaning this mess up. In frustration, he punched the water cooler's bottle. Like a shell-shocked witness to a catastrophic automobile accident, Garrett stood frozen to the spot, watching in horror as the water cooler rocked to the side, and the bottle fell out of its housing, colliding with the break room tile and cracking open. Gallons and gallons of water gushed from the crack, quickly turning the break room floor into a pond. He shouted, a primal, raging howl. <coughs> he had been frustrated with the idea of cleaning up a small spill. His lunch break was now going to be entirely used up, mopping the water off the floor. He'd be lucky if he found time to still eat. Once the momentum had been broken, it was so easy to fall back into his old habits. Two days not writing quickly became four, and then seven. 
The dreams hadn't returned in this time, and Garrett was able to convince himself that they were nothing more than dreams, and any threat of consequences was a laughable flight of fancy. He was a writer, after all, prone to making things up. Rose began acting strangely. She stopped going out to play cards with her friends, and even wanted to spend time with Garrett. They had sex more than once every two weeks, and Garrett didn't know what to think of this new woman. On a rainy Saturday night, Rose insisted that they should go out and see a movie together. Unfortunately for Garrett, who was hoping to see Vacation, which looked hilarious, Rose had her mind set on seeing Flashdance. The songs were all over the radio and MTV, and the girl that was the main character was pretty fine, so he relented. This turned out to be a big mistake. Even though Rose snuggled into the crook of his arm, and it felt like ten years in the past, the movie was nothing more than a stream of music videos running one after the other, with almost no story in between each. It went from dancing to workouts to figure skating to break dancing, with nothing to hold it all together. Garrett was quickly bored to tears. He tried to amuse himself by sticking his hand up Rose's shirt, but she hadn't changed that much and swatted it away. He wasn't even watching the film anymore, merely staring at how pretty Rose looked in the flickering light of the projector, when one of the characters said a line that penetrated his boredom and made him sit up and take notice. You give up your dream, you die. The character was trying to convince the lead female to try out for the dance conservatory, but the context was lost on Garrett, who hadn't been paying attention any longer. Instead, he was seeing his characters in his mind's eye. Chandra, Oles, the Fly King, and the rest. His dream was to be a writer. He'd wanted it since he'd read his first John Carter of Mars novel at eight years of age. Now he was pushing 40, and he'd taken almost no steps toward achieving that goal. He was like the dancing girl in this worthless film. He'd given up on his dreams, and even if the embodiments of his characters never came back to give him another headache and bloody nose, he was dying all the same. He was unhappy with his life, but instead of doing something to change it, he was simply riding the current in a boat with no motor, sail, oars, or rudder. He'd wasted so much time. But it wasn't too late. Starting tomorrow, he'd never pass another day without working toward his dream. He found himself floating in a black void, watching a strikingly beautiful brunette sway as she strolled toward him. And he went cold. Wait, Chandra, wait. You can't punish me. I've done well. I've written several stories. Look, the Fly King's not here anymore. Neither is old, see? He waved his arm toward the other embodiments that were appearing on all sides of them. You wrote a couple of stories, that's true. The statement hung in the air. Chandra didn't speak for a moment, but Garrett knew that when she went on, she'd start with the word but. But you've given up on us again, Garrett. You quit. Every time you finish a story, you let life get in the way, and don't go on to start the next one. That's not fair, he was pleading. You don't have to deal with the real world. You don't understand. It's hard to keep at it. There's always something keeping you from writing. It's hard. No, Garrett, I do understand. There is always something keeping you from writing, and it is hard. If you're not committed, then you'll quit. We tried to commit you, but it didn't work, so we're going. Wait, no, please. If you give up on your dreams, you die. Pain began building in his head. The various embodiments of ideas that crowded around him in the black void began to vibrate, glowing with light and sparking. Everything shook, as if a bomb had gone off in his head. The pain was so intense, he wouldn't have been surprised to see a mushroom cloud erupt from his ears. It was a three-mile island meltdown of his mind. So excruciating, Garrett would have guessed that each molecule of his brain was breaking apart one by one. Around him, the embodiments flashed and disappeared. Then his eyes were open, and he was sitting up in bed, and he was screaming. <coughs> his scream was long, unbroken, and hoarse. He could feel blood coursing out of his nose and even from his ears and eyeballs. His body was convulsing and, try as he might, he couldn't make it stop. Rose was awake and at his side. 
Garrett. Garrett. What's going on? Are you okay? And then all went dark. He woke up in a hospital bed, surrounded by doctors. Mr. Trembley, you're awake, said one doctor holding a clipboard. Rose was in a chair against the wall with the kids, and two other doctors crowded around Garrett, deferring to the one with the clipboard. How are you feeling, Mr. Trembley? Garrett did a quick internal inventory. I've got a splitting headache. But other than that, I think I'm fine. Good. Good, said the doctor. Mr. Trembley, you had a pretty intense seizure about an hour ago. It was very prolonged, with excessive thrashing, convulsions, and clonic movements. We were worried that you might hurt yourself, but the seizure subsided before we were able to give you an injection to eliminate the convulsions. Garrett smiled. Good God, he was alive. It hadn't killed him after all. He didn't know how many of his ideas fled this time. He'd been under the impression that they all were going. But, as he thought, he could come up with several of the story ideas he'd been meaning to write for so long, including the story that Chandra was a part of. They'd taken pity on him, showed mercy. He was alive. He felt like Ebenezer Scrooge after he discovered Christmas hadn't passed after all. The spirits did it all in one night. It really was a rather violent seizure, though, Mr. Trembley. It even caused a good amount of bleeding. Do you have any history of epilepsy in your family? Or seizures of any kind? Rose was smiling, as were the kids. They were all glad to see him back with them again. No, he replied. Mm, interesting, said the doctor as he made a note on his clipboard. Your case is puzzling. It seems like you're out of the woods, though, but we're not really sure what's going on, Mr. Trembley, so we'd like to keep you here overnight for observation. No thanks, Doctor, said Garrett. That would be a complete waste of time and money. He knew what was wrong with him, and it was nothing that any test was going to discover. If he tried to explain it, they'd only think he was crazy. I'd rather be home if it's all the same to you. Garrett, Rose said, scandalized. Actually, Mr. Trembley, I think it's pretty important that you stay here this evening for safety's sake. I know, Garrett said. But I'm going to go home tonight instead. I'm sorry, but it's where I want to be. I'll be fine. Garrett, Rose protested. I can't deal with you spitting up blood on me like that again. You need to stay here. Don't worry, Rose, Garrett said. I won't do that again. Now, Doctor, if you could unhook me, I'd like to check out of here. Garrett was scared straight. Like delinquents that get to tour a prison's death chamber on a field trip, he decided he would do everything he needed to do to change. Like a smoker trying to quit, he tried to create a support system. He asked Pablo to call him every night at 9 o'clock to check up on his writing status. He talked to Joey, a mechanic at work, and asked him to check on how his writing was coming every day as well. He explained to his family that he wanted them to help him achieve his lifelong goal and asked them to pester him about how he was doing. Rose never did it once, but his kids took to the role surprisingly well, considering their young ages. With everyone on his side, it was difficult to slack off again. After the first time he looked into his son's big blue eyes and told him he had failed to write, he never skipped writing again. He couldn't bear the hurt in his eyes. Garrett's speech on achieving his dreams had obviously hit home better than he'd expected with his son. Now, if he failed himself, it was as though he'd purposely failed his children as well. While everyone watched Garrett with held breath, expecting another seizure to put him in the hospital, or even the grave, Garrett continued to look and feel better each day. Writing was hard work. Not hard like breaking rocks in the hot sun, but it was challenging mental exercise, like what an accountant or a lawyer goes through. Before, when it got hard, Garrett would simply give up and watch Knight Rider instead. But those days were gone. It may be hard work, but it wasn't death. And he felt that he'd received his absolute last chance. Two months went by, with four new short stories completed in that time. Rose never jumped on the wagon with him, however, and one Friday in October, he came home late from work with plans to write the last 1,000 words on his most recent endeavor to find her emptying the contents of her drawers into a suitcase. What's going on, Rose? He asked, confused. 
She flinched when she heard his voice, but then set her shoulders and returned to her packing. Without even turning to look at him, she said, I'm leaving you, Carrot. You are? Yes, she said, her voice quavering slightly as she jammed a pair of jeans into the suitcase. I'm sorry, but I have to. I'm not happy with you. And I found someone else who makes me happy. You have? Garrett was stunned. He merely stood, rooted in place, his arms hanging limply at his sides. Yes. Travis loves me. And I love him. Travis was the lawyer that she worked for as a secretary. I'm going to live with him. I'll call you, and we can work out what to do with the kids. But I love you. She chuckled dryly. No, you don't, Garrett. And you know it. It's been a long time since either of us could muster a feeling for each other that could be called love. It's okay. It'll be better this way. You don't want me around anyway. All I do is hurt you. I'm so unhappy that I, I can't help but say the most horrible things. She zipped up the suitcase, now bulging with her clothes. You've been sleeping with Travis for a long time, haven't you? Jeez, I should have realized. It's not your fault. Or anyone's fault, Garrett. We'll all be better off this way. You'll see. Then she threw on her coat and swirled out of the room with her suitcase, leaving Garrett behind, still rooted in place with his arms limp at his sides. He heard her car start up and tear out of the driveway, spitting gravel as it went. The sound faded away, and his strength went with it. He leaned back into the wall and slid slowly down until he was sitting on the floor. He tucked his head between his knees. He wanted to cry, but he just couldn't make himself do it. He felt like he should be upset that his wife of 14 years had just left him for good. But he wasn't. The words she'd left him with couldn't have been truer. They hadn't been happy together for years, and things really would likely be better this way than they had been. He felt like he should do something. He should go tell the kids what had happened and prepare them for what things would be like now. But they were asleep, so that would have to wait until morning. Despite the fact that things would likely be better than they had been, he was still overwhelmingly depressed. Fourteen years, basically his entire adult life, had been a big waste of time. He and Rose had built nothing together. Just a rickety house that had now collapsed under its own weight. Was this what his life was leading to? Maybe he'd have been better off to have just died months ago when he had the chance. He needed to do something to keep from sinking much deeper into his depression. He was going to have to be strong for his kids in the morning. Maybe he should go out for a jog or something. Then he remembered the 1,000 words he planned to write to finish up his story. Writing might be hard work, but it was also a lot of fun and a great escape. Garrett grabbed his notebook and a pencil and started scribbling away. And soon, his troubles popped open the car door, strode around, and got into the back seat. It was a hard time over the next few months as his family fell apart and then reassembled itself from the pieces. Through it all, Garrett remembered the lesson that he'd learned that first night. When he was creating, he was having fun. Writing stories helped him keep his head above the ocean of depression that threatened to engulf him at all times. His kids finally found a new routine, his house on weekends and his wife's house during the week, and they managed to move on. In April, the divorce went final, resolving itself with no acrimoniousness from either side. Both Rose and Garrett knew that it was in their best interests to work things out. April was also the month that Garrett received his first acceptance letter. It was to a tiny little fanzine out of Utah that probably only had a circulation of a hundred copies. But it was a start. A start that he would never let stop. So, he was confused when he found himself in the same sumptuous living room where this had all begun. Chandra, clad in shimmering, wiggling red sequins, strode toward him. What could she want? 
He'd done everything that she'd ever asked. He could only write so fast. Surely she couldn't have more demands and threats. She slid over his chair's arm and plopped softly into his lap. This wasn't what Garrett had been expecting. He'd never seen her act this way. She grabbed him around the neck, pulled him close, and planted a kiss on his cheek. Oh, Garrett, I know you don't want to see me anymore, but I had to come one last time, she said. No, it's okay. If you're going to be like this, then I want to see you as much as possible. You're nice to look at, you know. Because of you. After all, I'm your character. <laughs> right. He chuckled. I just wanted to say thanks, Garrett. It's hard to keep writing, and you've gone through some rough times, but you kept at it anyway. We all appreciate it. It's so wonderful to know that we're all going to get to live outside the walls of your skull. We're all just so happy. It's a party every day. Well, I know this is weird to say since you're a character that I created, but thanks for getting me going. If it weren't for your uh, tough love, I would still be wishing and dreaming instead of doing and achieving. She pulled him close again and planted another kiss, this time on his mouth. Then everything faded out, and he woke up in his bed. That afternoon, Pablo had a surprise for him, too. They sat down at their usual table at Long John Silver's, and he reached into his bag. His hand came out, holding a copy of Analog Science Fiction and Fact. Check it out, he said. Garrett looked where Pablo's finger was pointing, and there it was. Right underneath James Patrick Kelly's name was a name he recognized even better. Pablo Velasquez. Holy crap, you're an analog? That's right, man. It's like you said, I just needed to put it out there and give myself a chance to succeed. Congratulations, Pablo. That's so rad. How are you doing, Garrett? I'm doing pretty good. I should complain, but I can't. He took a bite of Hush Puppy, chewed, swallowed, and said, I might have to have you introduce me to some fine lady you know, though. You know, <clears throat> maybe some of your sloppy seconds or something. Oh, I don't know. You're awfully damn pale. It's hard to find a girl who'll go for something like that. Garrett laughed <laughs> and finished off his hush puppies. He couldn't help but smile and be happy. Despite everything that had gone down, his life had only gotten better. Pablo was in analog. Garrett himself was in a fanzine from Utah, and it was only a matter of time before he'd see his own name on the cover of Analog, just under James Patrick Kelly. He was learning so much by writing every day and becoming a better writer with each story. Maybe, he thought, it's time to try my hand at a longer story. Maybe I should see if I can finally write that story about the guy who falls in love with a gorgeous woman, only to discover later she was actually an alien in disguise. I bet Chandra would like that. And she deserved it. The end. Author's note. We don't do author's notes when it's our own stories. But thanks, uh, Announcer Man, for saying that. Oh, hey, Announcer Man. I'm sorry, we didn't acknowledge him today. Announcer Man, thank you for being with us. Why did I even show up today? I thanked him a little bit. It's actually a legitimate question, really. Yeah, I know. You, you could just phone it in. <laughs> Why is he even here? Oh, it, it could have. It would have at least cleared the air if he hadn't shown up today because the, the, the layer of smoke. Although these days he's vaping, so that's kind of nice. Is that right? Yeah. Well, congratulations, announcer man. I didn't know that. I don't know if it's any better, but... Vaping. <laughs> <laughs> I think I hear your mama calling you, Rish. Anyhow, I guess we have to talk about the story. First of all, uh, thank you, to? Brian, for producing. Did he produce a cast list? Uh, Rish Outfield was our narrator today, and Big Anklevich played uh, Pablo and Blair. That time sounded exactly the same, unfortunately. Brian Lincoln <laughs> was our main character, Garrett. Veronica Jiguer was Chandra. M. Sierra Garcia played Rose. Rich is a big fan, by the way. M. She was on oh, the... Oh, she probably goes by Sierra, huh? She was on the Green Lantern podcast that I was part of, and I'd uh -huh. be like, oh, yeah. Now M. Sierra Garcia is going to do her part. 
Now I'm just yeah. going to lean back. Yeah, she does have a, a nice voice. Unfortunately, she got to play the biatch, so... Someone had to. <laughs> and you can check her out over on her podcast at the sci-fi diner podcast.com. And then finally, Mick Bourdais played the doctor. Oh, oh I think it's pronounced Bordet. Okay. Uh, Mick Bordet played no, no, the no. doctor. Bordet. Oh, okay. Uh, Mick Bordet played the doctor. Sorry, Mick Bordet. Uh, it might be pronounced Mike. Oh. I'm not sure. Uh, we're moving on. And Mick Bordet does the Every Photo Tells a Story podcast. I don't know if you've... Uh, I have. I went to that one time and I actually tried to write a story based on a photo. Yeah. I but apparently not every photo tells a story. Doesn't tell a good story anyway. Oh, that's <laughs> definitely in my case. <laughs> but yeah, they put up photos and, and that's your prompt for your story. And you're supposed to write a story that goes with that. And uh, I will go to that again, Mick. Just because you've encouraged me, and I will try to do another story. Yeah, it, it kind of interesting that that would be the person involved in our uh, story today, because the story was all about writing. It was, and and one one other thing, Veronica Jaguer, what was the story that she did for with us, for us, at us, in the past? <laughs> well, you know, the weird thing is, I I tried to search her name in our archives or whatever you might call it and the only one that came up was holy diver <laughs> holy mm-hmm. diver by ronnie james dio no she <laughs> sorry i wish i knew more of that song except for the title she was a voice on giving birth which was the story about the guy who cuts his finger off his thumb accidentally with his saw and then the thumb grows into a new hymn which was a really creepy story that we did a few octobers ago i believe but I swear, her voice has to have been in other productions since then. I'm not I'm not sure why I think that, but it sounds so very familiar. Maybe I've heard it on somebody else's podcast, and that's why I think it's familiar. I heard her on Escape Pod today. Oh. Now, granted, it was an Escape Pod from 1971, but it was a superhero story that she narrated where she was a super heroine who got pregnant and... Like her old nemesis, who was like one of those mad doctors, ended up being like her gynecologist. I, I know it sounds like I made it up. This is a real story. <laughs> but hey, uh, those were some really good voices. Uh, Brian always does a top-notch production. And uh, you should feel honored that he did your story. I do, I do. I begged him to do it, unfortunately, so it makes it a little less honoring uh, when I had to get down on my knees and kiss his feet and More the whole bit. Right? But, uh, you know, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. Nobody else would do my story, obviously. Well, if you'd like to prove Big Anklevich wrong and volunteer to produce a story, just let us know. Give us an email at editor at dunesteef.com. Say you want to produce a story. We got a bunch of stories that are just dying to get out there, to escape, to be out in the world, but they're they're trapped in the the accepted submissions pile, and they're just rotting there, kind of like the balloon man. Was it balloon man? It was the rainbow man? The rainbow. Oh, like a rainbow in the dark. Yes, rainbow in the dark. Ronnie James Dio. And let's right. talk more rock, everybody. Yes, on K Motherfug, where Ronnie James Dio never died. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about your story, about Battle of the Ideas. How long ago did you write this story, do you think? I want to say it's been two years. It's been over two years for me, and I'm still not quite myself. Okay. You can't be with someone new, and you can't go back to him. You're beginning to realize that it's sink or swim. I'm trying to remember where I first heard this story, read this story. Was this an idea that you kicked around for years and years and would always tell me about, or is this a story that just leapt from your brain in a very short period of time? Um, it did come about in a very short period of time. Uh, I've talked about, and I think I've, I'm sure I've talked about it on the show many times that I have ideas, lots of them that I've thought of and have never given birth to. And they just kind of sit there in my head. And, and I think you've talked about it where it's like I have a drawer full of rocks 
and I get them out every now and then and look at them and, ooh, this is a pretty one. Oh, my precious. And then I polish it for a little bit and maybe polish off some of the rough, sharp edges or something. And, and then I put it back in the drawer and close the drawer back up. And that's kind of the way I work with ideas is I have an idea and I think about it for a while and it becomes like a favorite for a period but then after a while, after not doing anything with it long enough, it goes away. I mean, it doesn't go away, though. It just goes back to the back of my skull, I guess. And another idea comes towards the front. This is one that wasn't like that, though. It, but it incorporated that whole thing. We've talked about the way that I write stuff. And I thought, man, there must be something in that. Because I, I remember saying, I think, once where I thought I wasn't having very many ideas recently and I thought huh maybe my ideas refuse to give me new you know I, my brain refuses to give me new ideas until I do something with the ones I've got you know it's like you can't have your dessert until you finish your peas or whatever you know kind of a thing and you're just like oh well that that's kind of an interesting idea and then yeah it fell into a story and it was a couple of years ago when we were going to do the 25 stories in 52 weeks thing that was two maybe three years ago and that this was the first story that I wrote for that I sat down I'm like okay I've got this idea and I'm gonna do it and so I wrote the whole thing and I wrote a couple other stories at the start of that year before it fizzled out but this was the first one of those okay I and I think I remember that period when we were both trying to be really, really responsible with our writing or prolific or whatever a positive word is. But correct me if I'm wrong, this story, you know, they say write what you know. People say that all the time. To beginning writers, here's some advice. Write what you know. This story seems extraordinarily autobiographical to me. <laughs> now, you, you're so? not a mechanic or anything like that. No. But, but help me out. Am I wrong? This feels like you are Garrett. Well, in a way, yeah. I mean, I am Garrett. Um, because, yeah, it's supposed to be about me, my ideas, and freeing them. It's funny, too, because I, I put you into the story. I don't know if anybody guessed who it was, but I'm sure they did. No, why would they think that was me? <laughs> I didn't think it was me when I read it. I remember handing you the paperback with, like, giant question marks every time I put my tongue in someone's mouth. I was just like, uh, wait, wait. <laughs> I thought this was supposed to be me. <laughs> Is she inflatable? <laughs> yeah, that was the point. I'm also not a mechanic. So, you know, I tried to change it around enough so that it wasn't you and me. But it was you and me because we were the two friends that get together once a week for dinner. Talk about writing. Which is what we always do every Monday night. And we record ourselves and we put it out on the internet. Of course, this story is set in the early 80s. So... There was no internet for them to do, so they just talked about it at Long John Silver's. But yeah, I, you know, it's somewhat autobiographical, but only somewhat. Okay, and and that's fine. Not every story has to be a true story, mm -hmm. or I would have written one story and that was it. Yes, I jumped over a rattlesnake once. The end. It's a, oh shoot, it wasn't even me that jumped over it. Wow, I've got no stories. <laughs> but but that's if. Uh, I had to stick to what has actually happened to me. But uh, the thing with your stories is I recognized an idea or three that came later that are actual stories that you've written. We had an incentive episode called Something Out There <laughs> that was one of the stories you referred to here. And I'm wondering, had you written Something Out There when you wrote Battle of the Ideas? Or did that come later? Was it part of that 25... I think I'd written it a little weeks. bit earlier. I think that it had been written that October for my October Scary Story, if I remember right. Uh, it may have even been a year earlier. I don't know. I'm it's so, hard to know at this I'm point. so old that the years all melt together and they're all one year. Well, yeah, when you're a kid, you're able to be like, oh, yeah, I was in Mr. Shankar's class that year when I wrote this or when I did this. Or, you know, it's like, oh, I was just doing this job or whatever but once you become an adult and you're in the same place and you have the same family it starts being harder and harder to separate i don't know if you've ever seen this show but if you haven't it's not it's a youtube channel so i don't know i guess it doesn't count as a show per se but there's this youtube channel this guy michael 
does these videos and he goes by the name of Vsauce. But they're these really, really interesting videos. They're mostly like science related, interesting kind of stuff. But one of the things he was talking about was about how when you are young, you know, you're one year old, for example, one year is your entire life. When you're two years old, well, then one year is now half of your life. But the older you get, each year is less of a percentage of your life. And so those years from the early period when everything, you know, each year was a monumental piece of your life kind of a thing, those are the years that have the most significance to people. And as you get older and older, they just kind of become lesser and lesser and blend together. And, you know, now it's one fortieth of your life or whatever and becomes less important. So maybe it's got to do with that. Okay, and that's that's totally possible. It, we've been doing the Dunesty for like 11 years at this point. Something like that. And it feels like two. Uh-huh. So, there's that. Holy diver. So, a big theme in this story, probably the biggest theme, is motivation to write. Outward, mo- well, technically inward. <laughs> but it's uh, some force compelling this guy to write and again technically impelling but <laughs> effort. that's a big thing in any creative person's life is oh i wish i had somebody who would say hey did you write today i told you to write today you said you were going to write today why didn't you write today f you k fug 106.1 and this is a really really muscular dude saying you need to write mother forcing garrett He's to write did have large pecs anyways <laughs> I hear you. Uh, for uh, Lauren Harris's podcast, I read a story called The Dragon Muse. I think I've talked about it on this show, but basically there's a guy he needs to finish his novel by a certain deadline, and he goes to this place that helps with writers, and it's a baby dragon He's, that's supposed to help people with their uh, writing. And what happens is every day the dragon gets bigger until you finish your book. But if you take too long to finish your book, the dragon will be bigger than you and it will eat you. <laughs> so it basically, it's his life. It's like, if I don't finish this thing right now, this thing is going to eat, man. Everybody deals with that in their own way. But it's an appealing idea to a writer is that somebody somewhere, you know, is, is going to hold you to it. It's going to make you. It's going to push you down in the chair and say, right. You can't leave this chair until you write. And uh, I don't know. In reality, you would resent the crap out of somebody that did that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like in The Dragon Muse, uh, the guy is not thrilled to have this dragon growing and hungering. And in your story, Garrett is not thrilled to have Chandra, as attractive as she is, you know, threatening him and... Forcing him to bleed from his eyeballs. From his eyes! (laughs) And yes, and, and oh, and his loving wife is so concerned about him screaming in the night. She's like, ah, look what you've done to the pillowcase, <laughs> you turd. They, do you think about that all the time? Do you wish that you had somebody that would be like, hey, you said you are going to write. You can't go to bed until you write kind of thing. I do, yeah. I think it would be helpful. It's interesting, at the end of the story, I was <laughs> we were just listening to the production of it before we started uh, recording here. And it gets to the part where he's like, yeah, and he set up a support system. And he asked his wife and kids and Pablo, everybody to help him out. And his wife Some didn't guy we've never heard of at, at the office. Is yeah, Joey. Ask him about it every single day. Marshall and freaking Clay just call in sick all the time. Screw him over. They but... are kind of worthless. Brian, I think, he he carries his own, doesn't he? Yeah, he was there. He, he helped out. <laughs> But <laughs> I started to insert like other people's names during the story just to annoy you. It's just like, I'm leaving you. Bosley Gravel can please me in a way you can't. <laughs> he says he's going to get a support system. And I, I was sitting there listening to my story tell me that and go. And I went, hey, that's a good idea. <laughs> I should do that. You know, this this B.D. Anklevich guy. Somebody must have. Somebody must be hiding around here. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, it was interesting to hear that and think, boy, I should do that. Thanks for telling me that, me. (laughs) 
But yeah, I wonder if that would work if I told my kids to get on my case about writing. I know that some of my kids would really enjoy getting on my case about something. So giving them something to get on my case about. Well, you know how some parents, they 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 want to raise kids that aren't huge undulating buckets of crap. What? I know I can't say crap on the air, but... Uh, <laughs> huge undulating buckets of cow. <laughs> uh, that's right. So they'll make like their kids do chores and have like a goal... Thing on the wall or whatever and it's like you know every 10 check marks you get or stars you get you know I, I is a night you get to sleep out of the closet one of the you know things will be you know make your bed or brush your teeth or you know and just things uh-huh. that they want the kids to do to learn responsibility and to learn to uh, make Feed it a the habit cat yeah and all these things i wonder what would happen if we as adults would put our own things on there too and it's like okay every time i write i get a check mark and when i get 10 check marks lap dance i don't know i just yeah something, oh, that something sounds good to nice. me i think i may <laughs> suggest that to my wife uh, actually i'm gonna go do that right now i'll be back i guess i have people that could bug me about things people. like that but it, it's always been such a solitary act for me the uh, listening to M. Sierra Garcia. No, I'm sorry. The writing process is, is a solitary act for me. But every once in a while, somebody's like, hey, what happened to that story? I know we've talked about that before. You said you were going to write so-and-so. And when I started with my Rish Outcast, I hoped that I would do more episodes, but life is in the way. And, yeah, it and finds a way. Wait, life finds a way. Running, it finds a way screaming. to get in the way. But I, I had hoped to present like, oh, I had an idea for this story. And mention it on my show and then have somebody say, hey, how, whatever happened to that story? And force me to write it. Somebody did that to you with an idea and you're like, oh, where the hell were you a year ago when I still knew how this ended? That's right. We were here. <laughs> well, we were in your old house and I was telling you about that. I had started blogging a story about a uh, kid who gets a cell phone and every year on the same day it rings and it's him from the future he somehow managed to get a hold of this old cell phone number and can call for two minutes or whatever. And so he picks it up and suddenly he's talking to an adult version of him. And he's like, I've only got two minutes. This is the stuff you need to know. It was in line for Comic-Con that I was writing this story. And then suddenly the line ended and I got to go in and sit down and I never finished the story. And somebody like a year later said, well, how does it end? And yeah, I was upset at first. It's like, why didn't you care a year ago when I still had this story in my mind? But that same night, I started thinking about it, that you and I had talked about it. And yeah, I did end up writing that story. And I didn't mean to run it on the show at some point, but okay, well, we'll, life we'll have gets to do in that. the way. <laughs> it does. Like right now, it's the middle of November. And at the start of November, I pledged to do NaNoWriMo. Oh, you fool probably was a fool but i thought you know i'd give it a shot uh it turns out that 1600 words a day is a lot of words but i still i was writing every day and i was proud of myself for at least doing that because that's better than nothing and then life out of the blue something happened my keyboard on my computer died a whole row of keys that z through m all stopped working at once and the period and the comma and all of those that went off the edge there too and I was just like, well, crap. And so uh, I used it as an excuse. You know, I watched the Dukes of Hazard instead. Night Rider. Um, yeah. <laughs> Who wouldn't, you know, I mean, seriously. But yeah, I, I kind of used that as an excuse. And so I haven't written in a week. Well, a great thing has happened. The new computer has arrived. And so it's time to get back to it, I guess. Tomorrow I need to write again. No more excuses because I have a keyboard that works. So I can't whine. And but all those episodes of Simon and Simon that you <laughs> wanted to get to. Yeah, I know. I don't know how I'm going to see them now. As far as that goes, by the way, I think we did do a quick episode just to say thanks to everybody who had donated at the end of our 13 nights of Halloween marathon. At that time, we still hadn't quite made our goal when we recorded it. But uh, yes, we made our goal. We were able to get a new computer, and so I really want to say thanks to everybody that donated. Thank you so much. We managed to make it, and it's saving NaNoWriMo and other things as well. Yeah, it's, I'm really excited to get back to it as far as the writing goes and also to use this thing to, uh, 
do all sorts of Dune Steve magic. That's right. You you can start editing episodes and producing stories and stuff. And you could either buy this computer or a solid gold helicopter with that money. <laughs> and... Okay, so you thanked them. Mm-hmm. And you're going to continue to write. Does sharing your stories on the show help you to want to write more? I think it really does. I found it to be really cool to hear a production of my story. And, you know, I don't want to sound like a douche or anything, but to hear it and be Too like, late. hey, I like this story. I think this is a good story. And to, to hear it and to be proud of it and to think, yeah, this is good. I enjoy this. This doesn't suck. It makes me feel like, yeah, you ought to get out and write some more. And maybe that will suck. Maybe it won't. But, uh, you know, I'll do my best. All right. Well, there's that's good. People can uh, leave feedback in the uh, forums. Yeah, hopefully they don't think it sucks. Cause... Oh, yeah, don't say that it sucks because <laughs> he won't do it again. Although, I don't know. You don't seem to shudder in fear the way I do of a negative comment. Maybe I give my enemies too much power over me. <laughs> but uh, next week we can find out, or next episode we can find out. Right. Because, uh, yes, as you were saying before, this is a two for Tuesday. Yeah. You know what they used to do at one station when I was growing up? They they did the threefer, and it was threefer madness weekend. <laughs> oh, hey, that's clever. Although it took me a second. <laughs> threefer madness. <laughs> uh, okay, so do you want to explain that? Uh, sure, yeah. It's a two for Tuesday uh, <laughs> here on KFUG. 106.1 so yeah basically what we've got is we've been meaning for a long time to get more of our own stories onto the show and uh we looked at the stories that we had and we thought hey this is good i've got this story called the battle of ideas rish has a story called the house of ideas and they're both kind of writing based stories and where your ideas come from based stories and so on. And so we thought this would be perfect. It's almost like a broken mirror kind of a thing. They weren't written in conjunction with each other because, I mean, I wrote mine two years ago. You wrote yours in like 2001 or something like that. So there was a quite a long space in between the two, but they go together really well. And so we thought we would uh, put them out as a twofer. Two for grace. Ew. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just, you know, put them together and as a little pair. And you guys can decide that mine is better. I mean... They can definitely decide that yours is longer. <laughs> which was, is high is. school all over again. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the thing with writers is a lot of times we write about writing and about what the process is. How many times in... Uh, your story did you say writing is hard yeah seriously it was totally like an episode of the show almost that's right even but talked it, about, instead of digging a ditch it's uh i don't know i think it may have said like breaking rocks in the hot sun or something i don't remember right. what i said i didn't say digging ditches though yeah i should have but I, I sold out no i always say digging <laughs> ditches you went the other way you broke rocks on a chain gang <laughs> so i guess we shan't talk about writing being hard I, and you know what? For some people, maybe it isn't. Maybe it's just like, oh, I can't wait to get home and write. Although I guess we felt that too. Yeah, you're I stuck have. in an office or you're stuck in a dentist's chair or you're stuck in your wife's best friend. And <laughs> you're just like, dang it, I wish I were writing right now. It would be relaxing. It would be way better than what I'm doing. I have not thought about that while I was stuck in my wife's best friend because I was happy to be there. But... Oh, uh, but I have thought that a few times where I just thought, you know, and that's usually when I'm in the groove, you know what I mean? This thing, the one thing that was very autobiographical about this story is how I would finish one story and then let myself stall out before I ever start the next story. That is often the way that I work. I'll write a story, get it all the way done, and then... The next story I never get started on for a long time. But when I'm in the middle of stories, I'm often really excited to keep going on it and to finish it, to find a way to get back working on it. Because I had fun the last time that I worked on it, and it's fun, and so I want to have more fun. No, anybody who's like a personal trainer or a uh, dietitian or whatever would tell you, when you've reached a goal, make another goal. Don't say, okay... Now I can be lazier. Now I can relax. 
It's like, no, you, you reached a, a plateau or you reached a rung on the ladder. Reach for another one. Keep going. Don't coast now. And with writing, yeah, if you start to get into the habit and suddenly, woohoo, hey, I've done it. I don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> it undermines the momentum that you've created. And, and I, I'm preaching to the choir here, but, you know, I do the exact same thing. Yeah, I, speaking of dietitians, I did that exact thing with my weight loss. There was a time a few years ago when there was a weight loss contest. And I got so into that and I kicked butt and I freaking won that contest. I lost like almost 40 pounds and I felt so awesome. And then I didn't like set another goal or do anything special. And I'm back almost to where I was before I ever started that. And it's frustrating how that can happen. So yeah, you always got to keep moving forward because there's no standing still. You're moving forward or you're falling. You're on a hill. You're either going up or down. You're on a hill on wheels. <laughs> so if you aren't going up the hill, you're definitely rolling back down. That's the way it feels to me anyways. All right. Well, hey, this has been an insanely long episode, but it's been a long time since an episode. So hopefully people appreciate the length, much like you in high school. <laughs> the forums are there and the comments are there at the bottom of the screen. If you have some advice about how you keep going with your writing goals, how do you write every single day? What do you suggest? What has worked for you? Please share that with us. It's fun to talk about where your ideas come from, where motivation comes from, too. Uh, you want to talk about that? That's cool. And uh, like you said, we'll be back next time with another episode. Can you believe it? Two episodes of the Dune Steef in a year? <laughs> That's a record, I think. I think it might be. <laughs> we'll be back with my story and similar themes. And maybe we'll have similar things that we talk about. Hopefully not. We don't want to be redundant. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody, and uh, have a good time until we see you again. I'm Big Ankovich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And this is KFUG, where the 80s never died. That's right. Let's talk more rock. Cow. <laughs> Sorry, this is all we've got for you tonight. I wish it was better, too. But the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Take two. First of all, uh, thank you, Brian, for producing. Did he produce a an author's note? Not. Did he produce a feedback after the story? What is it called? <laughs> the cast list. Did he produce a cast list? He did. He produced it for us. Would you reproduce the cast list for me? <laughs> sure. And uh, Rich Out <laughs> Rich Outfield was our narrator today, and Big Ink. <laughs> oh, wow, that one was good. <laughs> Holy diver. <laughs> Give yourself a zerbit with that one. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? What's the service? <laughs> Blow on your <laughs> kind of a thing. Some people call them raspberries, some call them all sorts of different things. But, anyways. How do I say this? I've never been a backstabbing, cheating bitch. Well. <laughs> no, you don't, Garrett. And you know it. It's been a long time since either of us could muster a feeling for each other that could be called love. It's okay. I'll be better this way. It'll be better this way. You don't want me around anyway. All I do is hurt you. Like those many times I hit you while you were sleeping with a book in the nose, and then you blamed it on the, your imagination. Sorry. <laughs> I'm so unhappy that I can't help but say the most horrible things. What is an Anklevich and why is it so big? Son, when you get a little older, <laughs> we'll have a talk. <clears throat> yes, it's set in a... It is? It's not set in present day. To watch brand new episodes of Dukes of Hazard and Knight Rider and... Aftermash. Simon and Simon. And Riptide. <laughs> I think maybe I'll start sending a... What was that? 
a woman with the voluptuous proportions that he'd only... Oh, hold on, you said voluptuous. I did. <laughs> See, that's why I need you when I read my own audiobooks. Because I, I, well, I wouldn't have picked up on that. I thought it was. I th thought there were three M's in that word. <clears throat> Depends on who you're talking about. It could be voluptuous. Sorry, I think I hit my nose on the newsstand last night. Or the nightstand, rather. <laughs> hit your nose on the newsstand? I was sleepwalking and there was a newsstand. You woke me anyway, douche. Rose growled. Oh, by the way, that's not really a line, Brian. Pablo's, pr Pablo's praise pleased him. Pablo's praise pleased... <laughs> One more time. <laughs> Pablo's pr... It had been long enough since he'd written the story in the first place that he'd lost his excitement. He'd lost his boner. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the same thing. That's not what Eeyore says. He doesn't say, oh, bother. What does he say? I guess he doesn't have a... I thought he did say, oh, bother. No, it's Pooh that says, oh, bother all the time. Oh, bother. Where's the honey? I'm not very good at Pooh's voice. I like it. <laughs> Walking when I do this. <laughs> she waited. Her fashion model... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just thought, thought, the thought of she kicks him in the nuts in his sleep and he wakes up and ow. And blood is streaming out of his nuts just like it did out of his nose. Oh, I wouldn't oh, have said that aloud. Man. It's just like, it's like, what have you done to your jockey shorts? <laughs> Me. Since he'd read his first John Carter of Ma, he'd wanted it. Since he'd read his first John Carter of Mars novel at eight years of age. I almost made it. <laughs> Do you want me to change Mars to an easier to say word like uh, defenestration? Okay. He'd wanted it since he'd read his first John Carter of Dubuque, Iowa novel at eight years of age. <laughs> I'm trying to remember if Flashdance actually inspired you this much. I remember you talking about seeing it and you saying it was just... You know, it was just music videos. That's all it was. Yeah, how terrible it was. I remembered it enough to know that line. Okay. But it, there wasn't a moment when she said that or he said that where you're like, oh, if you give up on your dreams, you die. Oh, no. I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> Even you are going to die, Big Anklevich. How does it feel to know you are going to die? And everyone's coming. And coming. And coming. <laughs> no, say no more. Don't even have to say it. Coming. That's good, and dude. Coming. <laughs> First of all, uh, thank you, to... Brian, for producing. Did he produce a an author's note? Not. Did he produce a feedback after the story? What is it called? <laughs> the cast list. Did he produce a cast list? He did. He produced it for us. Would you reproduce the cast list for me? <laughs> sure. Uh, Rich out. <laughs> Rich Outfield was our narrator today, and Big Ink. <laughs> oh, wow, that one was good. <laughs> Holy diver! You give yourself a zerbit with that one. <laughs> What's that? What's the zerbit? <laughs> Blow on your... <laughs> kind of a thing. Some people call them raspberries. Some call them all sorts of different things. But anyways. Stay. Bark, bark, wagtail. Good boy. Good boy.